Okay, thank you, Slava. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here in this very interesting meeting. Unfortunately, I cannot say long, but anyway, I try to benefit myself the best I can. So what I'm going to tell you today is a very <coughs> disturbing fact of uh, quantum field theory and actually how little we know about it and uh, the kind of problem we have really to understand better, in particular theory related to uncompact bosons. So indeed, uh, for that reason I decide to title my talk uh, the problems of the Sinch Gordon model. So just to have a track of what I'm going to say, I'm going to make some generalities. And uh, you will make uh, generalities that uh, let you be very easy with this model, but it's very, very, uh, I mean, you can be very fooled by this. Then integrability and uh, exact as matrix. Then I'm going to talk really of the subject which is really the root of all the problem of this model, which is its uh, self-duality. Alias, the model seems to be the same for weak and strong coupling, but this is uh, really where all the enigma come about by this model. Then I'm going to tell you about uh, better answers and what we can learn about finite volume. And we will see that this theory, as a matter of fact, is the mother of a very, very intriguing renormalization group flow, which lead to the so-called roaming trajectory. and minimal uh, conformal field theories. Then I'm going to sketch uh, form factor calculation, simply because I want to show you that the theory is unable to uh, um, unambiguously define its ultraviolet behavior. So all the root consists exactly in this problem. And uh, UV uh, property. And uh, finally, I'm going to present you the problematic formula, which are exact formula, but nevertheless very problematic. So the exact mass formula of the model and the exact uh, formula of the vacuum expectation value of many, many, actually infinitely many operators. And then uh, we'll discuss the problematic uh, Uh, aspect of this model, both from Monte Carlo point of view and uh, truncated the conformal space approach. Okay, so let me first present the model. The model is very simple. It's a bosonic field, a scalar bosonic field with this kind of interaction. So this seems really the best uh, field theory you can think of. Why? Well, several reasons. There is a unique vacuum. So it means that uh, you have not worried about hidden sector, topological sector, solitons, whatever. Whatever is in the theory seems to be under your eyes. Second, there is really fast uh, growing potential then uh, this uh, uh, lead you to think that you can simulate this theory very easily. Then is the simplest uh, symmetry, just the two. And moreover, if you expand to lowest order is phi to the fourth, which is a repulsive field theory. So you have not even to bother about bound states. So the theory, maybe the only content is uh, whatever, once again, is under your eyes. 
alias one particle, massive particle created by the field itself interacting. And that's it, nothing else. Now, let's dig more in detail. So if we expand the cosine, we get infinite number of uh, potential term, power law. So the theory looks like uh, an infinite type landau ginzburg theory. <coughs> Remember that the field in uh, one plus one dimension is zero dimension, so there is no problem with renormalization. All theories uh, trivially normalize if you just put normal order. And uh, so you have infinite number of coupling, even coupling of that type. However, the fact that there are uh, infinite number of these vertices change radically the nature of the theory and make it integrable. Now, this is very, very interesting. You can do really a uh, back envelope calculation. It's extremely instructive. Because what you can compute is, uh, imagine I assign you a Lagrangian with one bosonic field and uh, arbitrary set of uh, even coupling. And then you ask yourself, what are relation between this coupling constant such that there are no production. No production means you have uh, n particle, m particle, n different from m. And then you want that on shell, this uh, amplitude are zero. All, for any n and any m, at all order and coupling constant. Well, you can do the systematic way of doing, was pioneered by Patrick Dory. And then he did, let me just first do the three levels. And then when I find a condition, the three level, I will dress with vertex and this and that. And the story is extremely destructive. So let me just show you the simplest calculation. So simplest calculation is uh, uh, two going to four. So imagine I have just uh, five to the fourth. So two to four consists in the following graph. Okay, if you have phi to the fourth, so you can compute it. And the result is m square lambda four square divide 32 pi minus i m square lambda four square divide 96. And then if you have phi to the fourth, definitely the sum is non-zero. So you can have a production two going to four as far as you have enough energy to produce it. Now, if you want to kill this term, you imagine that you have the possibility to add a sixth term here. So you can add a sixth term here, you see, two going to four, but this is uh, five, six term, and the result is if you compute it with the proper normalization I'm doing, this is 48. And all these results end up to be zero. So what I mean is, uh, at any given order, you can compute some graph which involve the lowest order vertex and propagator, and the result is not zero. But then if you have possibility to include exactly the vertex which make n goes to m, so here there are no propagators, you can kill it. Okay? So if you do this. Why are you not putting any loop diagram? In no, no. <coughs> just at the three level. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, you, you are perfectly right. I'm just saying strategically, you can find some condition, simple condition, just look in the three levels. Imagine you find this, then you elaborate it further, okay? So I will uh, just make a few comments on that. So if you do at the three level, you can do at any order of this, you find an amazing, uh, beautiful uh, recursive equation that uh, as far as 
the coupling constant to the 2n vertex is proportional lambda to the 4 in this way, all these theory are integrable in the sense that the three level, there are no products. Okay? And then, if you elaborate further, you see that with phi to the 4, sorry, with Z2 theory, so only even vertex, you have only the ambiguity <coughs> if this term is going to be e uh, negative or positive. So at the end of the day, the three level calculation leaves as only possible theory made of uh, single bosons, just the sine Gordon or the Sinch Gordon. So here is cosh, G phi, and then there is a relative sine and the cosh. Now, imagine I fix this at the three level. I told you before that the theory is trivially normalizable. So you can, uh, it's non-trivial, eh? non-trivial. But you can check that all the loops essentially renormalize uniformly the mass. So it doesn't scale differently the coupling. Somehow, what changes the overall scaling here? It's not trivial. I'm not, I'm not claiming it's something that you can see it, but if you do all the calculation properly, what happens is that you have a finite or infinite, so the loop, for instance, are a finite here in this theory. You make a finite shift, but always the same. So it doesn't change anything. So say differently, I can put in a different way. It's known that sine Gordon and Sinch Gordon is classically integrable because there are inverse scattering methods you can compute uh, all the Lux pair, and then uh, classically they are integrable. Then uh, you have infinite number of conservation law that you can derive from this method. So you have to check that the normal order expression of these currents doesn't get anomaly when you quantize it. Okay, so this is... Uh, and remain finite. So to make the story short, Sinch Gordon is the simplest integrable model, which is Z2 even, consists of only one particle in the spectrum altogether, I'm going to derive in a minute, and therefore looks uh, absolutely ideal to try to understand basic things of quantum field theory. So if you want epistemologically, is the ideal laboratory playground where we can test something. But as I said, there are very disturbing features, <coughs> this coming later. Okay, so let's assume therefore is quantum integrable, as I say, I can prove it. So this means that uh, the S matrix is elastic and factorizable, so any n going to n things I can write in terms of two-body problem pictorially something like this. So I can concentrate only on two particle scattering. Then I parameterize my, my uh, dispersion relation in terms of rapidities. I think Joseph, it's one prop theory or a family, one parameter family of theory? No, no, it's one theory. Why, why you call one family? Because G. Ah, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, there is a coupling constant. Okay. No, no, it's going to play an important role. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if you want from this point of view, yeah, is a, there is an honest coupling constant, yeah. So I parameterize my dispersion energy of my particle in this way. You see they automatically satisfy Lorentz uh, dispersion relation. Under uh, Lorentz transformation, theta just additively change, therefore, the S matrix, which has to be Lorentz invariance, should depend on rapidity differences. So I define my S matrix like this, two particles. I have two particles of rapidity theta 1, theta 2. And then if I interchange them, the amplitude in front is called the S matrix. So, this is a convention also Gabor was mentioning before. Theta 1 is ordered larger than theta 2, and this one is ordered differently, means the two particles just have scattered together. And the amplitude is the S matrix. So the S matrix depends on the difference of rapidities, 
and they satisfy unitarity and cross sync. Now, where this equation come from? Come from the following. In uh, S matrix, you have a Mandelstam variable, S, which is P1 plus P2 square. If you write down, is uh, And t, the Mandelstam variable t, is p1 minus p2. This is essentially changing theta1, theta2 in i pi minus theta, because then this becomes minus i. So in the Mandelstam variable plane, the analytic structure of the S matrix is like this. You have a branch cut at m1 plus m2 square. And m1 minus m2 square is the t cut. So unitarity means the value of this matrix on top of the lip and below has to be 1. And uh, t channel is this analytic continuation. So if you say this map as analytic map in the theta plane, so let me call the upper lip of this branch cut like this. So E is mapped here, E2 is mapped here, E3 here, and E4 here. You can check. This is the analytic map I'm using. So you see that the unitarity is S, S minus theta has to be 1. So this is the. And the crossing is the same value of this matrix here and there. Okay? So these are the general condition that an S matrix has to satisfy. It. And for the, S for the Cinch Gordon, we have an exact solution of them. So the exact S matrix of Cinch Gordon is the following. S theta is equal sinh theta minus i sinus pb and b is a function of the coupling constant which has that expression. Now, I'm going to convince you that all the trouble of the theory come from this expression, alias from the duality. Let me explain what, what I mean. OK, so first of all, this is a really very, very simple function. So it's periodic. 2 pi periodic, 2 pi i periodic, and has zeros <coughs> rather than poles. So here, if there are poles in this physical strip, physical strip is between 0 and i pi, any poles here correspond to bound state. There are no poles there. There are just zeros. Okay. So where are the zeros? Let me use this one. So let me show you the analytic structure of this matrix. <coughs> so there are two zeros located in i pi b and i pi 1 minus p. OK? You can see immediately if there is a 0 somewhere, by this relation, there also should be a 0 in i pi minus the same. OK, now, this S matrix, 
uh, match perfectly the perturbation theory. What I mean is you can take, you can take this Lagrangian, this Lagrangian, compute the Feynman diagram corresponding to the scattering. This is very easy, actually, at least the lowest order. For instance, you have something like this, plus this, plus this, plus. You can compute all this. They are finite, finite. So this guy, for instance, gives rise to 1 pi minus 1 over sinh theta, something like this. And then you can expand this expression in terms of uh, coupling constant here and matching order by order. OK? Mm -hmm. Clear what I'm doing? I have an S matrix, which is an exact expression of the coupling. This is, formula is exact. So to all order and the coupling constant. So I can expand order by order in G, G square, and comparing with the corresponding Feynman diagram, which come from the Lagrangian. And the match is one to one. OK? Now you will see why this uh, is a kind of uh, mysterious things. Now notice that uh, if uh, here So this, this matching works directly for both the sinh and the sine board. Yeah, yeah. Now uh, I'm, going, I'm going to tell you, yeah. Now you can ask indeed, thanks for the question. So you can ask, where the hell uh, you come with this expression? I mean, you see, I mean, it's like a NP complete problem in mathematics. You don't know where they come from, but if you know the solution, it's easy to check. So this is the same. If I know this, it's easy to check. You can do all di Feynman diagram and this, but it's very difficult to do vice versa, OK? So where the hell come this expression from to start with? And so this is precisely the point that this theory is very much related to sine Gordon theory just by analytic continuation. So the analytic continuation, so sine Gordon, you have uh, cosh, uh, let me use lambda, phi minus 1. Now this theory is profoundly different from the other because here the corresponding vertex operator, the exponential, are compact. While there the corresponding vertex operator are uncompact. Okay? So here the theory is very, very well studied since long. The S matrix was known, consists of kink and anti kink, the spectrum consists of kink and anti kinks, and bound <coughs> state thereof. And the first bound state is the breeder, so kink anti kink uh, bound state. And the S matrix of this breeder was sinh theta plus i sinus, let me call uh, C sinh theta minus i sinus c. And in this case, as a pole, because breeder create a bound state themselves. Okay? So at this point, this is the famous Coleman things. Which uh, has validity as far as lambda squared is less than 8 pi. This is the famous Coleman bound. Where the bounds come from? Come from the relevance or irrelevance of this vertex operator. When lambda squared is bigger than 8 pi, this guy is irrelevant. So at least from renormalization point of view, the theory, strictly speaking, uh, is free theory. Although, I mean, one can discuss, but the, the thing is, uh, is no longer, there is no longer a mass gap there, okay? So if you want to make sense of uh, sine Gordon as theory of kink, uh, bound state, mass gap, and so on and so forth, lambda square has to be strictly an 8 pi. But when we make this analytic continuation, the analytic continuation in lambda goes in I lambda, which I call G, this becomes minus G square, and this becomes plus. 
So what was uh, the pole here become uh, my zeros. And what was a bound there now become completely invisible bound. OK, so this is where uh, this matrix come from. OK, then once you have it, you can check it. OK, now these things, uh, as it is, very nice, but is very, very puzzling. All the enigma of the model is here. So let me explain why. The thing is, uh, so let me cancel now the sign Gordon. Let me concentrate here. So you see that, uh, imagine uh, I'm, moving, uh, I'm moving G. I'm making G1 bigger than J2. So these guys are going to move one toward the other. OK? So I increase G, and they move in the complex plane. If I increase G, you can plot this function. What happens if you send the G in 8 pi over G? If I make a weak, strong duality, what happens is that B simply go in 1 minus B. So what happened is that the two zeros swap just the position, but the analytic structure is the same. OK? Clear? So if you make weak, strong duality, B going to 1 minus G, B goes to 1 minus B, but for what the analytic structure is concerned, you have just swapped the position of the zeros. So it's exactly the same. So the theory is self-dual for what the S matrix are concerned. But where the hell is written in the Lagrangian? I mean, if in the Lagrangian you substitute G, 1 over G, completely different things. There is no 1 over G in the Lagrange. Nevertheless, the calculation that you get from duality matching with the Feynman diagram is exact. What I mean is, uh, once you have a function like this, the dependence is not G squared. The dependence is G squared divided 1 over G squared. Therefore, imagine that you expand this, which is already a sinus. You expand in coupling constant. Already at the fourth order term, the contribution is both from sinus of G squared, but some term which come from downstairs. OK? So what I want to say is even at the level G4 and further, the number, precise number, is a combination which comes from the expansion of sinus but of the expansion also this function. And much perfectly the perturbation theory of this Lagrangian written only in exponential of G. There is no 1 over G there. OK? So this is a very puzzling thing. But it's the same for all strong, weak, strong cutting qualities, no? You mean for other theories? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Any phenomenon that the duality is not. Not every, yeah. But you see, what I found here, uh, at least, I mean, uh, is that the theory looks so simple. There are no hidden sectors. You see, in other theory, the structure is so rich. You have uh, monopoles, you have kings. Even a sign order is not self-dual. It's dual to something else, to tiering. So you have uh, other degrees of freedom. You see what I mean? Is uh, here, since the theory consists of only one bosons, and it's able to do all, uh, all these things, OK? OK, now let me also mention something which makes the theory particularly appealing, also from an application point of view. What is uh, really appealing is that imagine you restore uh, the velocity of light in all the Lagrangian, in all the formalism, and then you make the double limit c goes to infinity, c is the velocity of light, and g goes to zero, such that c 
time g is equal lambda is equal finite, what you can prove is that the Cinch Gordon reduced to the Lieb linear model, whose S matrix, so the Lieb linear model is the one which consists just of uh, free particles, not relativistic, because I'm taking C goes to infinity, with delta function interaction. This is really the easy model of cold atoms, is how you can uh, discuss uh, the property of uh, one-dimensional <coughs> bosons. And actually, you can use all the technology of Cinch Gordon, for instance, the form factor bad answers I'm going to describe in a minute, to compute property directly in atomic physics. So in particular, you can derive a recombination rate, you can derive correlation <coughs> function, and this and that. So this has been checked also in, uh, in lab. So I want to say that a part of being uh, an interesting model uh, in itself, there is a payoff, a byproduct that goes directly in experimental physics and atomic physics if you just do the proper uh, non-relativistic limit. Now, let me introduce new tools to study the theory in more detail. And the first tool is uh, the thermodynamic by the answers. How did you end up with a non-relativistic limit of this? As I said, you have to restore uh, the uh, velocity of light. So I usually in field theory we disregard, right? C equal one, H equal one. You have to do all this exercise. And then you take C goes to infinity limit. This is how you realize non-relativistic one. And then there is a very interesting trick. So you have to disentangle fast mode from slow mode. And then the fast mode, when you integrate it, it goes to zero. And then what is left out is uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So gross beta yisk, essentially. And this matrix match perfectly with the Lieb linear one. And then once you do all the other formula that you just make this trick simply like that, you can recover free all the quantity of Lieb linear, which is pretty, pretty nice for what, for why, uh, for which reason? Because in field theory, usually you have more constraint than in non-relativistic one. For instance, in field theory, you have duality, this uh, equation, which doesn't hold in non-relativistic one. So the theory is much more constrained, and this is the reason why people working in atomic physics were unable to compute easily correlation function Lieb linear, while if you come from Cinch Gordon, you get easily the, the result. Okay, so let me tell you other aspect of the theory which uh, appear in finite volume through the thermodynamic beta answers. So let me sketch the idea what it is. Thermodynamic beta answers, you take large volume L, you compactify it in temperature one over R, and you compute the trace of your theory. So uh, here, the Hilbert space is made of particles which scatter all the way around. But the number of particles is conserved because it's integrable. So you can do exact the trace, OK? So I make the story short. You can compute the ground state energy as a function of the temperature r. And this is parameterized in this way. in terms of what is called the effective central charge. So this is standard normalization of uh, conformal field theory. And then there are a set of equations, integral equation, which uh, compute the ground state energy. I'm going to write it, and then I will comment. So 
So the formula has a very, very clear uh, interpretation I'm going to spell out for you. So look, look this formula here. The formula here remind very, very much the formula of a free fermion particle, okay? So it's an integral. If you write like this, you will recognize immediately. Logarithmic one plus e to the minus beta e, right? This is just, so the Cauchy here is just a change of variable in the rapidity I'm doing. The only thing we change is that instead of having the energy of the particle, we have a function which is called pseudo energy, which is uh, self-consistently determined by itself. So these things satisfy an integral equation which involves the free part that will be this one, but then bootstrapping through the interaction with all the other particles with the same distributions. So this equation is very, very nice because you are enforcing the most you can the free quality of the theory because integrable theory is essentially the closest to free theory you can think of. But the only difference is that what played the role of energy is not the energy of a single particle, but is determined self-consistently by the all other particle present in the system through a kernel, which is just derivative of the S matrix, okay? So the message is here is that for what the finite volume is concerned, the S matrix determine everything, <coughs> even the ultraviolet. This is the message. Okay, so you can in particular study what happens for R goes to zero. So you can study what happened to the central charge, the effective central charge for R goes to zero. So you see, you can solve numerically this equation as a function of R, and then plot C versus MR. And the plot is like this. So it's one minus some coefficient logarithmic square mr plus blah, blah, blah. So you get the central charge of a free boson theory. Okay, now I will come back to this because once again it's very disqueezing. Seems very simple, elementary, but then you will see what is behind this. So, now let me introduce another part of the story, which is the form factor. Is this logarithm in the denominator significant? Very significant. <laughs> Very significant. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is absolutely significant. Because in other theory, for instance, in uh, theory of the minimal models, if you take POTS model, or if you take easy magnetic field, the correction is always power law, never logarithmic, never. And this is the, the signal that theory is, uh, I mean, related to Liouville is what I'm going to, to tell you in a minute. Okay, form factor provide another window, another view on the model, because uh, give you access to the exact test matrix of local operators. So form factors are defined of a field I call Psi. By definition, is this matrix element. Now, this uh, is, uh, I'm not losing generality, because any matrix element in which I have uh, any number of particle here, or even the point, at x, so the field in x, I can shift it uh, with the momentum. And this particle are against the momentum. So this matrix element, if I have x, 
differ from this just by phases. On the other hand, I can cross any party on the left hand side, I can cross here by uh, crossing symmetry. So what I want to say is that if I know this function, precisely this order, vacuum this, I have access to the full glory uh, matrix element in any, in any configurations. Now for the cinch Gordon, this calculation has been done in full glory and uh, let me just sketch what it is. It's like this. Okay, so let me tell you what it is. So an S matrix is like this, a form factor is like this. Here is the vacuum, is here the field, here is the particle. So this uh, matrix element has a certain very strong constraint. It. For instance, if I take two particles and I cross it, this is going to be the S matrix. So this means if I take F theta i, theta i plus 1, and the rest untouched is going to be related to the same function when I cross the two of them, okay? Because each time I interchange for the relation to S matrix, I shall get an S matrix. So this property of this function is taken care by this function f min, which satisfy this functional equation. It's easy to solve it. This function has an infinite number of pole and zeros in the complex plane. But I mean, there's precise expression, we don't, we don't need it. I just want to say that everything, once again, depends on S matrix, I can find explicitly the solution. It's very simple by, by uh, Fourier transform. You see, imagine that the S matrix is exponential i dt over t f t sinh theta t over phi is a phasis. I can always write like this. F and F which satisfy that equation is simple given by this Fourier transform. You can check immediately. And then if you make the, uh, the infinite product representation, you find infinite number of pole and zeros and so on and so forth. So I want to say this function is well known and determined by this. Then what is this factor here? I told you that uh, Cinch Gordon do not have uh, poles. So you can never uh, have uh, a configuration like this in which you take two particles and go on shell and having a pole. But what can have is uh, I can take three particles and make this configuration, where here is the transmission of the S matrix. Now you see to do that, two particles has to be head to head. So this is really the S matrix. So this means that the only pole this amplitude can have is when all the rapidity different by any other by i pi. Okay? So this kind of amplitude shall have necessarily pole each time the rapidity difference end up to be i pi. And this is taken care by this term here. In all possible channel. So this is uh, product of this is elementary symmetric polynomial in X. Okay, so what is left out is uh, a generic symmetric polynomial 
in X, which is not determined at all by the analytic structure of this matrix. This is what genuinely depends on the operators. Because so far I never tell you which operator I'm considering. So summary, the form factor is a structure which is fully fixed by this matrix alone. You cannot do anything about it. What is left out is a symmetric polynomial in X and different symmetric polynomial characterize different operators, okay? And in the past I've been computing it exactly and I, I've been found together with Kubek an infinite number of solutions of that because there are infinite number of operators with very uh, in remarkable result in terms of determinant of symmetric polynomial. I'm not going to write for you, I'm just telling you that this symmetric polynomial are known, you ask me any operator you want. You say, can I give me the form factor of phi square? Yes, I can. I just go take <coughs> the formula and give for any number of particles and for any couplings to all order, okay? Okay, now this is the things. Now let's go in more detail. Sorry, but is that a constraint or? Yeah, yeah, I, I, indeed. I, I'm going to describe exactly now. Indeed, how you determine this uh, symmetric polynomial? You determine exactly through the recursive equation that the form factor has to satisfy. So this uh, n particle form factor is related uh, to n minus 2 precisely by residue equation which involve uh, this matrix. So here is a pole, you see? There is one particle here and there is a pole. So this determined a recursive equation, I'm not going to write for you, something like minus x, x, x1, xn, has to be a very well definite polynomial in, uh, in uh, symmetric polynomial in x, qn minus 2, x1, xn. You have to find solution of this infinite number of recursive equations at once. So this is uh, why this form of determinant works, because in a way, encoded this recursive structure, okay? And then, where is the field? So, so far, once again, it's general. The field, you have to fix me some condition. For instance, phi square, I define as the field which create, is different from zero, at level two. Phi four, normal order, I define the field which has zero matrix element up to four, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I can uh, classify the operator in this way. And then I can define also vertex operator, which is much better because they find another condition which is called self-clustering. Alias, I can take the exponential by definition if you take derivative and this and that always remain the same. So it's a spatial operator after all, I can do it. Now let <coughs> not me enter in the things. Now, what I want to point out, leave out all the detail. The thing is, <coughs> noticed, I have a recursive equation which jump in two so let me denote it by this, the number of particles, n equal p, n for me is the, the number of external particles. So you see, I have a way of relating form factor in this way or in this other way, but I'm never able to have an operator which link even with odd number of particles. They are completely decoupled. So, let's talk about stress energy tensor, which is probably one of the most important fields of the theory. For the stress energy tensor, we know two things by basic stuff. We know it's vacuum, so, so it's the simplest form factor, and this comes from beta answers because I can compute the free energy from that, and the free energy is the, and the expectation is phi m squared, the renormalized mass, which will be my concern later, sinus the same function b. And then what you know 
is the two particle form factor on a on a general basis simply because the stress energy tensor if you integrate is the energy of the theory this is fixed to be uniquely this one you take the stress tensor or its trace the trace trace the stress energy tensor altogether since satisfy conservation law if I know the matrix element only the trace I can reconstruct all the other components just simply by conservation law. so it's enough to have that so you see general theory allow me to fix a zero expectation value and two particles but never one particle never but why should they be by the two symmetry that should vanish no no this is the point the point is the stress energy tensor you can alter with charge at infinity so this is the point so if you have a, a theory with t mu nu i can alter the theory with t mu nu with a parameters which i call charge at infinity field phi i can have always this ambiguity to add uh, divergence okay how about phi squared to create phi squared at least there is no problem oh no but there is no problem uh, phi square i mean you have to tell me what you are calling phi square phi square is the solution of this equation which uh, has uh, on the two particle states is normalized to one mm -hmm. or and then on go to phi four and go on but am I correct to say that phi squared is not going to couple to three? three yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. This is the point. This is the point. The only things where the theory has this ambiguity is the stress energy tensor. All the other, there is no way you can do it. Also here, when you add the odd term, all the chain which comes from the odd term goes in its own way. There is no way of relating the, the two chains. Okay? But when you do that, the UV uh, ultraviolet, the theory, change completely. Because once you add this, TT two-point function become 1 plus 6 Q squared divided Z minus Z2, 4. You can check using form factor, of course. And then the vertex operator become uh, a different with delta of uh, V alpha, delta of alpha. So V alpha for me is uh, exponential alpha phi. Now it's alpha Q minus alpha. Okay, so what is the important lesson? The important lesson is that Lagrangian and S matrix can never fix UV. Okay? This is what I mean. Is this uh, match with the content of the theory? Eh, this is the problem. So I have to take once again the Lagrangian uh, But you said the center charge is one starting from the S matrix. Wait, wait, wait. This is this is a really wait. Actually I have to I have to be precise. This is the effective central charge. So let's take once again the Lagrangian. And now let me write like this. Now I want to interpret this theory as the formation of some UV field theory. But then I have a big ambiguity because I can take this theory as Gaussian deformed by the symmetric Z2 combination of the vertex operator. This makes a very precise commitment of the stress energy tensor. I'm choosing central charge equals zero. Or I can take this as UV, this is UV, 
But to make sense of Liouville as conformal field theory, I have to add charge at infinity, right? Because this operator now has to be dimension one, deformed by this one. So the stress energy tensor will change the central charge, okay? Or I can take this as Liouville and deform by that. So there is an intrinsic ambiguity what you are doing. You can have infinitely many other possibilities, like add some terms, subtract it, and so on. <coughs> Which of these gives rise to the S matrix? No, the S matrix is untouched. Untouched because this term is completely invisible. This is a total derivative. This is the point. This is precisely the point. This matrix, which is infrared data, is completely invisible to any perturbation theory. Okay? It's not obvious. Maybe some of these non perturbative definitions could give rise not to an unintegrable theory, but. No, no, no. This, this uh, preserves, as I say, this preserves any integrability. This is built up because it's just uh, admitting the presence of odd term in the stress energy tensor. Simply like that. This is completely compatible doesn't affect all the chain of recursive <coughs> equation. Everything is fine. Now, unfortunately, I'm running out of time. So let me tell you two amazing uh, things which are coming out from it. So from Liouville, you know that Liouville is a non-compact theory and has a lot of, uh, uh, is a very complicated theory to, to build, I mean, to discuss it. In particular, there are no correspondence between uh, operator and states as it happens in any other conformal field theory. In particular, there are continuous set of states that correspond to vertex operator alpha, but alpha has to be Q half plus E, the momentum, P. Now, here is the point, central charge effective is, uh, remember that the Hamiltonian is L0 plus L0 bar minus C over 12, and then the dimension one over R in the. So you see that uh, if this L0 eigenvalues is non-zero, you have an effective central charge, which doesn't coincide with central charge, but there are minus 24 delta mean, okay? So if you consider the theory as uh, go Sinch Gordon, so C is one and this guy is zero. So you get exactly this uh, one minus this one. But if you consider Liouville, you get exactly the same result. Exactly, because Q, this alpha, remember the formula delta was alpha Q minus alpha. So if you insert this as a minimum states in the theory, and you compute C effective. C effective is one minus 24 P square, the momentum of this particle. And the momentum is quantized by what is called uh, the Liouville uh, reflection wall. So you can take Sinch Gordon like two Liouville, <coughs> one far apart of the other. So particle leaving here momentum P arrive here reflect back, arrive here, reflect back, and so you get a quantization like sp square equal to one, <coughs> essentially. There is factor in r here which determine the story. So you can compute p as a function of r, and when you substitute, you get exactly the same. So what I mean is, uh, even from the final formula, you cannot decide. It's completely compatible with both interpretation. Even uh, Sinch Gordon has a Z2 theory, no particle, everything. Or as Liouville, uncompact with a hidden sector with a lot of stuff behind, the formula at the end is a completely the same. But uh, since I promised you some mystery, I have to tell you the mystery. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time. The mystery is uh, you can compute for this uh, theory, Sinch Gordon, the exact mass formula is an exact expression I'm going to write for you. Is uh, four pi gamma one plus two plus two i g square <coughs> gamma one plus Two 
simply bore it. It's, uh, it's what it is. I cannot do much. Uh, you have to to be pleased that exists an exact formula. I mean, to all order. So this is the formula. Once again, you can check it perturbatively, but what is the mysterious of this formula? So what does this formula define? Define the exact mass gap of the theory as a function of the cutoff, which you put to define the theory, and as a function of the, sorry, of the coupling. <coughs> to all order in the coupling. Okay? Now, what is disturbing of this formula? What is disturbing is that if you plot it to fix mu, vanished at the self-dual point. Vanished. Okay? And so this is uh, pretty disturbing because uh, you don't know what the theory is below that, I mean beyond that. Moreover, this formula is the only formula of the theory which is not self-dual. Doesn't respect self-duality. So here is the real problem. What is the theory here for g squared larger than 8 pi? What it is? What is behind the Hercule column? What is behind that? Is a theory which is still massive? Or here become massless. Now, I have to tell you a little part of the story and then I close. You remember that there was uh, these two zero that move together when I move the coupling. When I write to the cell dual point, I can put them in the complex plane. I can just make analytic continuation. I can compute the central charge effectively. So I'm doing uh, B equal one half plus I theta zero. So I'm putting <coughs> here theta zero. Now what happens is that if I plot the central charge like this, the central charge starts to get staring case behavior with a quantized value which match all the minimal models. So the value is one minus six <coughs> P, P plus one with P integers, okay? So the theorist knows all this scale behind. Amazing. Moreover, if I make the plot real and uh, complex coupling, here is the sine Gordon line, and here is the column unbound. So here the theory is massless. Here is the cell dual point, 8 pi. Now, if you do the massless roaming, which is massless, the trajectory is just a semicircle like this, where the theory is massless as well. So you see what is uh, the, the, the puzzling guess. Here the theory is massless. Here is massless. Well, I mean, you might imagine the scenario that altogether, as a generic function of the coupling, the theory is massless wherever, even here. And the only massive case is here. Unfortunately, we have no way of checking this. Uh, it's a technical point. It implies TSS, uh, truncated conformal space approach. And once again, the origin is what kind of conformal field theory are you taking in the UV? Because you have to choose a basis to make the calculation. And the fact that you have non-compact bosons affect heavily the calculation. So we have been trying a couple of approach all of them failed in a way or another. One failed trivially in the sense that we, we choose the basis of compact bosons to compute the matrix element of unbounded and the energy level were pretty, pretty bad. So the energy level were something like uh, these are the lowest ones and there is always some uh, highest line which cross all the other and make the story completely out of. Then we have using zero mode technique, alias to select out that zero mode and construct excitation on it. It worked pretty well for small value of g, but it failed miserably when you go g squared bigger than one half. Why that? Because uh, you have to 
acknowledge the following things. Operator pro expansion of cosh of 2G on two points is kind of a trigonometric expression. You get something uh, which goes minus 2G squared, and this is fine. But then you get cosh 2G phi, Z1 minus Z2, 2G squared. Since the theory has expectation value, this term become marginally relevant as soon as g squared becomes bigger than one half. So you have to take this term in. But once you have this, you have to add the third term, the fourth term, the fifth term. So the theory just explodes under your eyes. And so it's, it's kind of problematic. And Monte Carlo doesn't help either. For the simple fact that if you want to decide what the mass term here is, you know, in Monte Carlo, you have to do the simulation, but then you have to scale uh, the lattice side to zero. You have to go to the critical point of the theory, right, to get the scale. But here means that the mass is already zero, or you have to play with the cutoff to be finite. Because the, the easy answer from quantum field theory point of view is that, look, the mass is not zero as far as you take mu goes to infinity. Yeah, but in Monte Carlo, you have no, I mean, you define mu and then the theory get you what it is. Uh, so it is a question. And moreover, the fact that the theory grows so fast make the Monte Carlo worst and worst and worst. Because you can never uh, span more than the vacuum. Larger g you got, you stuck to the vacuum. And so, I mean, it's amazing uh, frustration that you have a theory which you know essentially everything, but there are some basic disturbing things which, uh, which are, uh, I mean, are really at the, at the moment impossible theory to figure out. So this work has been done with uh, Robert. I mean, we are working on it since, since long, actually. And uh, as I said, it's very challenging. And, and uh, so this is what I can offer at the moment. So just puzzling. Uh, question and the poor understanding we have so far. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess, uh, the, the, so the basic picture is that the uh, naive duality that you had in the S matrix is not correct, you're saying? No. No, no, no. Well, so you can work it out, everything from duality for what S matrix is concerned. Okay? So everything, I mean, you are never, you are never uh, uh, sensitive to the issue. Now, you start be sensitive to the issue when you pose the problem, can I compute the, the actual mass gap of the theory as a function of the cutoff and the coupling? And the answer is yes. This formula comes, once again, from better answers. Because from better answers, uh, you have on one side the energy expressed in terms of mass, physical mass, on the other term, I express in terms of perturbation theory. You match the two, and you extract the mass gap. Okay? But once you write to this formula, you can check, once again, perturbativity that is working. You just compute the loops and this and that. But when you go to strong coupling, I mean, the theory vanishes. There you, I mean, you don't know. At least uh, I'll never be able to go to extremely higher order. So you see this, and the formula is not self-dual. Is, is the only formula which is not self-dual. Now, the way out, uh, this is what uh, Alyosha Zamologikov, which actually computed first this formula, was his way out to this. He said, well, at the end of the day, mu is uh, an arbitrary parameter. So if I go g goes in 1 over g, I will define some new mu. So you see, I can write this as mu sum function g. This function is not self-dual, but then I can make this guy self-dual just define mu tilde such that he holds like this. After all, he say is arbitrary parameters. I, I'm not very satisfied with that. I mean, because it seems that at a certain point you are changing the rule of the game. And moreover, re the question remains. Is this really a critical point of the theory? I mean, critical point defined must be at zero, or is something else? And from uh, renormalization, I mean, from uh, roaming trajectory, 
this is the picture. This point is directly connected to this by roaming trajectory. Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's really puzzling. I really don't know, honestly. I, I have no idea. Uh, so it's fair to say that for g less than 8 pi, we are pretty confident that here is massive, everything works uh, to, to the best you can do. You have uh, out of uh, nothing this cell duality, because it just pop up the cell duality by this analytic continuation of sine Gordon. You bite. Seems that in any, in any formula workout, except when you ask the right question, what is the mass gap? The mass gap is not cell dual. And then has all this property. Is there yeah. a lattice version with you that preserves integrity? No, uh, no. I mean, uh, in the sense that once again, or better, there is, but it's not efficient as well. Because once again, the problem is that the boson is not self, is uh, uncompact. This causes a lot of problem. This is the real uh, origin of things. So. Final question. Is there a boundary version of the story that could give you some insight? Sure, there is. Uh, you work it out exactly. Uh, web. I didn't talk about the web. The web is exactly the same phenomenology. Everything is cell dual except term which depends on the mass. Uh, in the boundary, there is similar story. There are uh, web as well. Everything, uh, the mass once again pop up there. So you, you I mean, you, you got exactly the same problem. <coughs> there is no way of opening a window and making, uh, and making uh, progress on that. Exactly. So for instance, the web, any expectation value, any of any operator has mass, the, the same mass minus 2 alpha square times an exact function of uh, the coupling. This guy is self-dual function. So if I do g going 1 over g, this function is self-dual. But this term is not, for, because it's the exactly the same formula. And this web satisfies an amazing property. If I call ga, ga satisfies the, the reflection matrices of Liouville of q, which depend on q times g q minus a. And then you might say, but where the hell I, I, I'm telling you are using Liouville. I never, uh, because you see, the anomalous dimension is Gaussian. Very puzzling, really very, very mysterious. Very, very mysterious. Is it fair to rephrase this problem as saying that you're looking for a a renormalization scheme that preserves this soft duality? Because all these problems you're seeing is related to the, the cutoff you're imposing. That it's, not, it's not really a purely quantum field theory. It's not a continuum question, right? It's how the mass in the continuum is related with the cutoff. <coughs> what do you mean by this? I mean that all the formulas that only talk about quantum field theory observables, they are self-dual. Yeah. Only when you express things in terms of a UV cutoff, you are seem to have some problems. So yeah. No, there's no UV cutoff in the map. No, there is no. There is no. No, no, no. This is a no cutoff, I mean uh, is mu, the, the one you define the bare mass. Yeah, but it's okay. But okay, if you want, bare, yeah. Bare parameter. But it's bare parameter, nothing else. Nothing else. I mean there's nothing but, but it's not a physical observable, that's what I'm saying. Indeed, I mean, there is a formula that tell, give me your mu, I will define the, I mean, mass has to be expressed in terms of mu. The of question course. is that formula, first formula, yeah. does it define the theory or not? Yeah. It does. <laughs> Which formula? The first formula on the blackboard. This one? Is it, is it a definition of a UV complete theory? Eh, uh, I mean, this... <laughs> or is it just some platonic, you know, <laughs> equation? <laughs> Because there are some formulas of that type, for example, if the interaction were not exponential but polynomial, yeah. then, you know, provided that you normal order it, it's a definition of a UV complete theory in a mathematical sense. Now, that formula goes out of that framework. So mm. perhaps that there's a problem with that formula, perhaps that formula doesn't make sense.
Uh, I, yeah, I think you are, I mean, you can rephrase like this. As I said, if I give you this, yeah. you don't know what to interpret because uh, if you interpret like you will deform it, and by the way... But that's a separate question. Let's interpret in the simplest possible way. No, by simplest it's possible... No, simply, impossi simply <laughs> possible way is that this theory, defined like this, a central charge equals zero. Because you are treating them, any expansion in G, if you do perturbatively in G, is Z2 even. Yeah. So essentially from the... Now my, if you want, my main message is theory Lagrangian, probably in this case is particularly severe, other is simpler, are unable to fix the UV. Is somehow a parameters free, even though the formula you can derive are not contradictory. It's the same expression that you can interpret in two different ways and they are consistent both. Because the S matrix doesn't know anything about UV. So it's are amazing things. It's not simply to find contradiction. You see what I mean? You say, well, if I did this, then the formula doesn't match, means no, no, no. Everything works perfectly. The only way where you start thinking that some alarming, something is going on weird, is this commitment of this mass. Actually, I, I probably have to tell you how this mass <coughs> formula well, come prob out. No, probably we have to wrap up and then discuss giving light. So let's Let's thank Giuseppe again.